Hello and welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside Ronnie Dahl in the studios of Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. In addition, today, as always, we are on Birmingham Area Municipal Access. And on 88.1 WBFH, the BIF, a service of the Bloomfield Hills School District with operations out of Bloomfield Hills High School. Both our TV stations, Civic Center TV and Birmingham Area Municipal Access, are on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99. In addition, we're on CivicCenterTV.com. You click on our Watch Live link and you can watch the entirety of our live shows Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 12 noon in high definition. In addition, today we are on the, the Facebook page of West Bloomfield Parks. They are our Facebook partner today. We'll be joined by Parks Naturalist Lauren Azuri in just a few minutes after we go through today's top news headlines about coronavirus, COVID-19, and other top stories on civiccentertv.com. Slash coronavirus today, our top story is casinos are given the green light to reopen, but new restrictions are in place for up north. Governor Gretchen Whitmer gave the go-ahead Wednesday for Detroit's three casinos to open at 15% capacity beginning on August 5th. The casinos were ordered closed in March because of the pandemic, but... Governor Whitmer is also dialing back economic reopening in northern Michigan, reducing the size of groups allowed to gather and banning indoor alcohol sales in nightclubs and other establishments that mostly serve alcohol with little food. Those changes go into effect on Friday. Governor Whitmer this morning, uh, well, late last night, tweeting about the decision to reduce the capacity limits allowed in the state of Michigan due to a recent up the recent uptick in COVID-19 cases uh, including up north which is a, which is a, the jarring part of this because up the up northern regions of the state regions 6 and 8 in the northern lower peninsula and and the entirety of the upper peninsula were already in phase 5 and seeing a dialing back there should be a cautionary tale for everybody down here in the lower peninsula especially in southeastern Michigan where coronavirus has been a bit more of a hotbed in this local area I think part of the up north restrictions come because so many people down here are going up north for vacations and plus we're going into the Labor Day weekend pretty soon. So maybe these precautions are put in place so that they don't see a surge going in and leading up to the holiday weekend. I will say I was a little surprised that she did these, made this announcement the day after her press conference. Why not make it at the press conference that you just had the day before? Because clearly these decisions were probably in place prior to that. Yeah, it would be interesting to know when she had the information she needed in order to make that decision. If that was on Tuesday, it does bring up the question as you as you asked Ronnie, why wasn't that announcement made at the press conference where you could take more questions on it, give more clarification? Uh, now you're going to definitely get those questions coming from around the state of Michigan today as Governor Whitmer has updated some of the regulations uh, at this point in the Michigan Safe Start Plan for the entirety of the state. That includes uh, portions of the northern of the uh, of northern lower peninsula and the entirety of the upper peninsula other top stories on our website on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus run for bogue street run for run for hagedorn msu students living on campus have tested positive for COVID-19. Multiple Michigan State University students living at Holmes Hall have tested positive for the coronavirus. An email was sent to students living in the building Monday alerting them to positive cases. Students who tested positive are self-isolating and the university is working closely with the Ingham County Health Department to reach out to anyone who may have had closed close contact with those infected. Holmes Hall has been used as one of the university's summer housing locations. On-campus residents who test positive have the choice of self-isolating either at their off-campus permanent resident residence or designated university self-isolation space on campus. I did read earlier on that the university was uh, working on decisions for the fall semester in terms of rerouting where people are living if they're living in, in camp, on-campus housing um, to provide one entire residence hall specifically for COVID-19 positive people to be housed in for isolation. I believe that was going to be Acres Hall, if my memory serves me correctly. So this is definitely a scare for the campus at MSU as they're a couple weeks out from people moving in to, to places like Holmes Hall, and they have multiple students testing positive in one single residence hall at this point in time. 
This is going to play out on college campuses all across the nation as the students go back to school in the fall. A lot of conversations being had by family members right now. Do I send my kid back to college if they're just going to be remote learning? Or if I'm, do I go ahead and put them in off-campus housing where it is a little bit more contained and a little bit more secure? So a lot of decisions being made by family members right now, and we are getting down to the wire here. It continues to add to the element of uncertainty for these colleges and universities as students are set to return in just a matter of weeks. Uh, other top stories today, opioid overdoses are on the rise during the coronavirus pandemic. The number of opioid overdoses during COVID-19 pandemic has increased dramatically across the state, according to new data from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Emergency medical services responses for opioid overdoses from April through June were up by 26% over the same period in 2019. Between April and May of this year, as the coronavirus decimated Michigan and the nation, EMS responses for opioid overdoses rose by 33%. The increases in overdoses were consistent throughout the state and in most demographic groups, except for those ages 65 and older, the MDHHS said. For months, experts have predicted that overdoses would increase during the pandemic due to isolation, boredom, job loss, and other financial crises uh, that would amount. We've talked about this with many guests uh, in recent weeks on the show, how substance abuse issues can be exacerbated by situations like the pandemic, particularly because of what was listed here, such as isolation and, and other traumatic events in life such as job loss or financial crisis that can lead to increased opioid overdoses and that just goes back to those issues of mental health care and uh, and substance and, and help for these substance abusers just in general times as this is not just an issue specific to the pandemic all the experts that we have interviewed on the show said this was going to happen they had already seen it happening and i think it's going to continue to get worse as this drags out the reminder to everyone who is out there who is struggling reach out talk to someone if you're not comfortable talking to your family your friends call the support hotlines that's what they are there for Michigan reports nearly 1,000 new COVID-19 cases, 996 new cases of the disease were reported on Wednesday, including 300 older cases from a backlog of test results from a commercial lab. The overall case tally surpassed 80,000 known cases Wednesday, reaching 80,172 cases of coronavirus and a death count of 6,172, according to the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Michigan also reported about 1,000 new cases of COVID-19 on Sunday due to, due to a backlog in, in its system as well. The percentage of positive coronavirus cases in Michigan has been gradually increasing since June. The positivity rate was reported at 3.2% on Tuesday. And Dr. Caldoun had mentioned this in the press conference on Tuesday that evidence of community spread is, is at about 3% positive rate or higher and, and that the CDC does recommend under 3% to be considered in a safe range uh, where community spread is not prevalent in a given area. So still, that's part of the reason why there's such caution in Lansing, particularly from the governor's office, about advancing in the Michigan Safe Start Plan and even with the decision today to in some ways uh, dial things back a touch as coronavirus cases continue to fluctuate. Tyler, I know we talk about the numbers and we have to remember the numbers aren't numbers, they are people. Mm -hmm. But there always seems to be such a discrepancy in the numbers and until they get a handle on the testing and the results, it's going to make it harder to make these spur of the moment and quick decisions to be able to help contain this virus. The governor had said this multiple times at the press conference on Tuesday, which you can watch online on civiccentertv.com slash megacast and see the entire thing. She had mentioned that every decision they're making now influences decisions that are being made two weeks down the line. We'll know now what the impact of what we're doing now has in two weeks, and then the decision will be made at that point as a reaction to what we're doing right now. And this is a reaction to behaviors over the past two weeks as they're going to influence down the line. Interesting that that point's made, and then decisions like this are made uh, out of an abundance of caution, of course, and, that, and that's the governor's prerogative and should be what 
the decision that she takes in, in this case. But with all these backlogs in cases, seeing the rise of cases really be it as a result of the backlog. We see today 996 new cases, but 300 of those are backlogs. So you have about 696 new cases, still a spike in that case. So even if you are questioning the governor's motives in this case, that is a lot, one of the larger numbers we've seen this week and at the height of what we've seen during the spike. One of the good things coming out of this, though, we are not seeing the number of people being hospitalized. Yeah. And yesterday, the doctor said that one of the reasons being is that we have various ways to treat the virus now, and that is helping to you know, ensure that people are not getting so severe that they need to be hospitalized and they don't need to be hospitalized for a long period of time or on a ventilator. And plus, it is that younger demographic, that 20 to 29 year old age group, that the numbers are spiking. That being said, still all the reason to be cautious when you're out in the public and to follow the rules and regulations that are in place because the whole point of those is to prevent further spread of the virus and with younger people being less susceptible to severe symptoms and more likely to be asymptomatic carriers of the virus that could uh, uh, not following those rules could exacerbate the spread and put us in a position where the governor has to take even more evasive action two weeks out from now which will then have severe impacts in the fall all those stories and more, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. In addition, we have links to reputable resources about the coronavirus from the federal, state, and local level. The Centers for Disease Control, the state of Michigan, and Oakland County direct links to their COVID-19 pages, as well as the COVID-19 informational pages for many of our municipalities in our local coverage area, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus for all of that information, and you can and you can. Go to civiccentertv.com slash megacast for all of our full episodes, interviews, and short clips about those subject matter and more. Uh, today, we are also joined by West Bloomfield Parks, our Facebook partner on today's program. And our first guest today is their parks naturalist, Lauren Azuri, joining us now on the Oakland County Megacast. Lauren, thank you for being with us today. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate having you on. How have you been since we last spoke? Good, really good. You know, it's really great to have a job where I work outside because as you know, um, health is important right now and being outdoors is really great for people's physical and mental health. So being at work and being able to be outside with um, people and helping them be outdoors as well is, is really good. Yeah. At this time of the year, it, it's such a nice time of the year in the state of Michigan. People are always out and active and especially now when there's so fewer other opportunities for recreation and fun activities for individuals and especially for families, there's even more opportunity to engage with nature and engage with our local parks uh, at, at this point in time. What are some programs that are in place through the parks, through West Bloomfield Parks and, and your job there as the parks naturalist that allow families to engage in nature and learn as summer camps and other activities are on a lesser scale this summer? Yes, we were very happy to brainstorm and come up with some new things that are COVID friendly and make people feel safe. So all of our programs are either virtual or outdoors in small group settings. So we are able to give families that um, experience still, but just on a smaller scale. So most of our programs are 10 to 20 people. We split up groups and we just released our Midsummer Guide, which is something new this year to adapt to the times. So our Midsummer Guide has programs that are virtual and outdoor in-person programs. A lot of them are nature ones, really cool hikes and things that are all of our programs through from August through September. Now we didn't mail it out like we usually do our brochures, so it's all digital because as things change, we're able to change it then if needed. But you can find it on wbparks.org. And if you just scroll down to the bottom of the screen, the Midsummer Guide is there. And it will uh, mention a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about today. We have a firefly night hike, a s'mores hike, um, all different family appropriate adventures. We're also offering a senior hike Many of our other senior programs are virtual, but luckily we are able to offer some small guided naturalist hikes. So as we walk the trails, you might learn something new about what's happening outdoors right now in this time of year. Lauren, we always have this debate at my house, is it firefly <laughs> or is it a lightning bug? But I will say it sounds like such cool programs you have going on. How do parents who maybe well, can't go to those organized events, how can they spark this interest in the younger, in their kids? Well, it's so funny because people assume that you have to have this big park or this big 
nature area to explore nature. But I've actually taught um, education programs in like the city of Chicago before, and you can find bugs in the sidewalk crack. So you have to just think outside the box a little bit. And if you don't have access to nature right by you, just look in the sidewalk cracks. You know, you never know what you're gonna find. And to settle your debate for firefly and lightning bug, you're both correct. It's a, it's a common name and it's a regional. So it's kind of like a woodchuck and a groundhog are the same thing. Two names for the same animal. <laughs> Lauren Azuri with us, Parks Naturalist at West Bloomfield Parks on the Oakland County Megacast. Lauren, I see you're in the nature room at West Bloomfield Parks. There's a number of animals in there. Some of them are, li are living animals and some of them are just displays. So take us on a little bit of a, of, of a tour of what we have in the nature room at West Bloomfield Parks for people to engage with. Yeah, it's a great educational resource. So we use all of our live animals as well as our mounted taxidermy animals in all of our education programs. Even though the nature room is closed to the public right now because we can't be indoors together, we are able to bring a lot of these things to our outdoor programs. So here we have six different animals all in their habitats and they're all reptiles and amphibians. So they're cold blooded, um, scaly or slimy animals and almost all of them are Michigan native animals. That means they're from here. So it's really great way to learn about animals that are in your backyard or in your nature areas by meeting one of them up close and personal when you wouldn't get to do that outside on your own. Most of them hide or, or slither away from us pretty quickly. So these animals um, are captive. We do have proper licensing to have them from the DNR and we use them a lot in our programs to help uh, families, adults and children of all ages learn about them. I do have a few here if you'd like to meet one of them. Sure, yeah, let's, let's do that. Yeah, so one of our um, animals that's really unique that a lot of people don't get to see very often is a salamander. So cool. our salamander here, if you wanna say hi to everyone out there. A salamander is actually an amphibian, so it's cousins of a frog or a toad. So as a baby, it was a tadpole and hatched from a jelly shell egg in the water until it finally went through metamorphosis and changed into what you see here. This one is an eastern tiger salamander. And we bring this one out a lot for programs when we're learning about wetland animals or when we're learning about forest animals. Because as a baby, it lives in the wetlands, and as an adult, it lives in the forest. So we can talk about the importance of animal habitats and homes for everyone. But it's a great uh, opportunity and a lot of times we are able to touch the animals because they're used to being handled when normally we wouldn't recommend that you touch an animal outside in the wild so having these animals we call them our animal ambassadors we don't really think of them as our pets but they are like a naturalist just like myself they help us teach people about animals that live in michigan Lauren is very with us <laughs> on the oakland county megacast very interesting there the salamander you have uh with us so we have a turtle too if you'd like to meet our turtle yeah that's meet the turtle also so one turtle you can see behind me swimming kind of back there in the aquatic habitat. And that's a red-eared slider. It's an aquatic turtle. And we like to leave it in there because it loves the water. But when you come visit the nature room, it does like to swim back and forth quite often. But the animal I want you to meet today is a box turtle. So this is an Eastern box turtle and not very big in size. This is as big as she'll ever be. She is a species of special concern. So it's really unique that we get to house her here and teach people about how special she is. As a species of special concern, that means that she's one step below in danger. So there's not very many left of her in the wild. Now, remember I said they aren't our pets here. These are animal ambassadors. They help us teach the public about the importance of a wildlife and habitats here in Michigan. So she used to be in the pet trade and therefore was um, overused, re-released, things that weren't ha were happening that weren't supposed to. So that's why their numbers are low and having a captive one to teach people about choosing your pets wisely is very helpful. Plus she is very super friendly. And so if kids are nervous about being near wildlife or anything like that, she's a great teaching animal um, that is great for them to look at up close and feel comfortable and explore with. So this is an Eastern box turtle and she does have a habitat right behind me there. Uh, Miss Annabelle, one of our other naturalists is helping us give the animals enrichment. It's kind of different because they aren't visited as often right now by people and they are getting a little stir crazy, just like some of us at home are. So we're providing them with additional hides or additional things that might, what we would consider a toy, but something to pique their curiosity and keep them um, active. And so we are providing those things inside their habitat. So she's got some new bedding back there. You can see that she was digging a hut out of, and we give our snakes some different vines to climb on and explore. So we do have to give them enrichment and keep them active and engaged. And we also bring them outside too for a lot of our outdoor programs. So I will say we came across a turtle while we were biking the West Bloomfield Trail. They're a little scary, some of them. When you come across them and they're close to a roadway or in the path of 
bicyclists, should you try to move them or just they'll find their own way? So it's important to know what kind of turtle you're looking at. The ones on the West Bloomfield Trail Network more than likely are snapping turtles because I have seen them on there and I know what you're talking about. They do dig their nests along the side of the trail. They like sandy, rocky areas and that's the edge of the trail is like that. Um, so snapping turtles are much larger than our box turtle we have here. And see how she's got, she's got like a super rounded shell. Yeah. Snapping turtles have very prominent triangles on the back of their shell. So if you do see a snapping turtle with triangles, it's best to stay away. They do have a very strong bite and they do it to protect themselves. Um, what I do sometimes, I, I have in my car, I call it my turtle shovel. And during June, when the female turtles are leaving the water to lay their eggs, and you do see them more commonly crossing the roads, I kind of give them a nice push in the right direction, but don't get my hands close to their mouth. If it's a different species of turtle, like a box turtle or more commonly a painted turtle, then you can safely pick it up by the back of its shell, two hand pick up, making sure you're supporting it nice. But the main thing is if you want to be super helpful is to make sure you keep it going in the direction that was already pointed. It can easily lose its navigation and have a hard time returning back to its home. So you wanna, if it's crossing the road to the left, you wanna just help it cross to the left. Don't turn it around and back, go back to the right. So you can be a turtle hopper, you just have to be careful about it. And right about now, you won't see as many, but I bet you saw a ton a few weeks ago because um, that's their snapping turtles nesting season, usually in mid, mid to end June. Lauren Missouri with us. She is the Parks Naturalist over at West Bloomfield Parks, our Facebook partner on today's edition of the Oakland County Mega Cast. So, so Lauren, we're, we're in the thick of the summer now. It's been really hot out. We've had several heat waves throughout the summer, and uh, it's been really hot out the last several days here in southeastern Michigan. How does that heat affect wild animals like it does us humans? Many of them had, have adaptations that are you know, equipped for that. But the main thing that's tricky for wildlife right now to adapt to these heat is to, is finding food um, because a lot of our you know wildflowers are a little bit drier than normal and things their food sources are a little struggling a little bit if they're herbivores just like you might in your own garden at home notice that it needs more water at this time of year with the especially high temperatures that we've been having but the nice thing is that a lot of reptiles like our turtle here or amphibians like our um, salamander is they're cold blooded, so they rely on the heat in order to maintain their body temperature. They need the sun or something warm to sit on like a rock or a log. And so reptiles and amphibians actually are thriving at this time of year. They, they really do enjoy this heat <laughs> a little more than us humans do. And then they plan out accordingly when they're going to be out and about. So they don't, you know, if, if the temperature is too hot for them, they're not, they're going to go and hide and regulate their body temperature more so in a shaded area in the midday when the temperature is the hottest. So they are able to, um, help their body temperature out by moving their locations a little bit. But it is a little tiring for them, for sure. So they definitely need good food sources. This box turtle is an omnivore. So she eats, um, she's a carnivore and herbivore mixed together. So she eats things like worms and slugs and snails and bugs, but she also needs berries as well. So raspberry season's right around the corner. So she'll be finding lots of good raspberries outside. And she loves strawberries when those were blooming in May and June. We get our strawberries and raspberries probably from the grocery store, but they do grow out in the forest in the wild as well. Um, and they do like the heat, just not maybe this extreme heat we've been having. So hopefully we have a good raspberry crop for all those box turtles out there. Lauren, you are a wealth of knowledge. How do parents get their kids interested in nature? And how old were you and how did you foster your interest in the outdoors? Well, I definitely had a family, especially my mom, who encouraged me to get dirty. I wasn't yelled at for jumping in puddles or anything like that. It definitely helps um, make you more sensory and more sensory experiences you can have. The less you go, you, when you think of things. Um, so just fostering that curiosity in children is really important and allowing them to explore and getting dirty. Um, one little mess is okay to clean up for a wild imagination. It really helps brain development. And there's a lot of studies on the theory of loose parts and how playing with a stick and something outdoors is much better for you developmentally than a plastic toy that only has one button that does one thing. So um, exploring in nature is really important for our development. And enthusiasm is um, contagious. So as a family uh, doing things together right now, especially this with COVID and everything, it's really great to enjoy things and explore together. And if you don't aren't comfortable being outside in nature, let your kid be the guide. I have people tell me all the time, I couldn't take my kids on a hike like you. I don't know all of these things. I can't answer their questions. But really, just ask the kids what they think. It's really great for children to be able to 
um, explore and come up with answers on their own or learn it together. So bring out your field guide and look at that flower that's pink and big and you don't know the name of it and find the name together. So exploring together is really great, especially, um, like I said, enthusiasm is contagious. So if you're excited about nature, your, your family and your kiddos will be excited about it too. And it's great if you need help, you can always um, sign up for one of our programs. We have also Zoom with a naturalist. So if you're not quite comfortable going out in public and being in settings in small groups outdoors yet, um, our naturalist, Miss Annabelle and myself do Zoom appointments where you get to meet turtles and it's personal for just you and your family. So that's another learning opportunity for you too. Lauren, there's so much natural area in the West Bloomfield area for people to explore. What are some places you would suggest for parents and families and even individuals who are just interested in engaging in some of our great local natural areas to start and explore? Well, Marsh Bank Park has a fishing pier that is one of my favorite spots because it gets you out on the water. It's a floating dock and it's on Cass Lake, which is the deepest and largest lake in Oakland County. In summertime, we all think about water and the calming views of water too. Um, if you are under the age of 16, you can fish without a fishing permit. So you could always bring your kiddos to fish there too. So I love the fishing pier at Marsh Bank Park. It's a really great place to, um, to view wildlife in the aquatic setting. And then there's a bunch of great trails there as well. I also really love the West Bloomfield Woods Nature Preserve. So it's right off of the trail network and it's on Arrowhead Road. And there's no bikes allowed back there. So it is a little quieter and definitely lots of great wildflowers and wetland overlooks to explore there. So if you're looking for a true, more backwoods nature experience, our West Bloomfield Woods Nature Preserve is a great place to visit. And we do some guided hikes there as well. Lauren, anything else for us today before we let you go? No, just come and visit our website so that everyone can check out all the great outdoor, small in-person programs we're doing. Um, we have a other couple of special events too. So. Earth Day is every day, and as you all know, we've all been adapting with these COVID situations. So our canceled Earth Day program in April, we are actually going to host it in September, all outside, small groups, you can pre-register, and we can still celebrate the Earth and learn about it. And then we have some of our great other events as well, like our picnic in the park and our mother-daughter tea that we've made adaptations to, to be able to still enjoy the outdoors and recreate together in our West Bloomfield Parks. Well, Lauren, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate having you on. Lauren Missouri, Parks Naturalist at West Bloomfield Parks, with us on the Oakland County Megacast. And Ronnie, there's so much natural area in, in the greater West Bloomfield area, but really all throughout Oakland County. We have a great park system in our many municipalities. So Oakland County Parks are fantastic as well. So much natural area for people to explore, different forms of the natural area, from wetlands and woodlands to, uh, to lakes and rivers and so on, that allow people to see different elements of nature in everyday life. One of the good things to come out of this pandemic, so many people are cooped up at home. So what are they are taking advantage of getting outside and enjoying what is in our own backyard. You know, uh, Tyler, we live on the West Bloomfield Trail Network, and I always say I live in nature's playground. We have a mama deer and her two babies are always in the yard or you know, the birds, the squirrels, there's so much to see if we just slow down and stop and observe. And we're so lucky to have that and not be in the confines of a, a major big city. If you have some time, we definitely would encourage you to go out and explore some of the great natural areas we have here in greater West Bloomfield and in the local area all throughout our municipalities covered on the Oakland County Megacast. We'll take a quick break, and when we return, we'll talk about putting your business in the best possible position to thrive despite the pandemic. That and more coming up on the Oakland County Megacast. You're watching and listening to us on our family of TV and radio stations. Ronnie and I will return after the break. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. 
As rivals, we don't always see eye to eye. Like who scored the best recruits? Who's going to be who? And whether we wear green or blue. But one thing we can all agree on to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Wear a mask. 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 The ball's in your court, Michigan. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe, alongside Ronnie Dahl in the studios of 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV. Our flagship stations on the Megacast family of TV and radio stations. In addition, we're on Birmingham Area Municipal Access and 88.1 WBFH, the Biff. And today, our Facebook partner is West Bloomfield Parks. We're live streaming on their page, facebook.com slash WB Parks, the home of West Bloomfield Parks. Go ahead and give them a like, and we thank you. Uh, West Bloomfield Parks fans for tuning in to today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast and we hope you will join us every day Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 12 noon as we continue to, to discuss a variety of topics as they relate to the COVID-19 pandemic and this is a really tough time for our local businesses to be navigating through all the different uh, issues that have been created by the COVID-19 pandemic and joining us now as an expert in helping these businesses work through that is Karen Kalkany from, uh, she's a business and executive coach at Kokany and Associates with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Karen, thank you for being with us today. You're welcome. Great to be here and thanks for having me. We appreciate having you on. How have you been? How's, how's your team doing? Doing very well. Thank you. Hang, hanging in and uh, actually doing very well. For those who appreciate are- that. For those who are unfamiliar, introduce us to your business. What do you do? How do you, how do you help uh, people in our community? Well, as a business coach, I work with business owners and executive team leaders to bring out the best in people. It's a, it's a process, and we look at you know everything about a business to help the business not only survive but to thrive. Karen, during this time, it's it's so tough for these businesses to navigate all the regulations that are on them, all the different constraints for public health, uh, both for themselves in regards to their employees, but also to their customers. What what kind of advice do you give to these businesses to navigate all that, do so in a positive manner, and put their best foot forward to continue to be able to, to like you say, survive and thrive while also doing their part to prevent further spread of the virus? It is definitely some interesting times that we're in, uh, very much unprecedented throughout the world. And the best thing b businesses can do, it's what my business is doing and what I'm wor working with my clients, is just to stay focused. We need to stay the course right now. It's not to say that we don't look at, and I highly encourage us to look at, we go back and look at the strategy, the goals that are in place and we might make some small adjustments or changes to those as needed given whatever the current circumstances are but the most important thing is to not over adjust at a time like this so just stay the course stay focused always forward and that's why it's very important to have the right strategies the right vision mission and goals in place because that's used as your guide your your light to take you forward to where you need to go. The other very important thing at times like this is to keep talking with your customers. Our customers are the most important thing. They're why we exist. And ultimately a business exists to make money and we don't make money unless we have customers, right? So whether the customers are buying goods or services, keep talking to your customers because your customers are, are going to tell you what their needs are. You wanna be asking them you know, have their needs changed? Is anything uh, expected to change? If not yet, is anything expected to change? And this allows us to stay ahead of the competition as well as to just keep a compass for what might be needed in the future so that we can future-proof our business. Karen, with so many businesses trying to manage their flow of money right now due to the loss of business during the pandemic. How do you convince them that a service such as yours is wise for them to invest in? 
Great question. Many business owners, even leaders and executives within organizations, they feel very, very isolated. And perspective is something that is really needed in business. We often don't even have, people don't have self-awareness and we are products of our experiences. So we may not be making decisions, the best decisions or managing our resources in a way that's in the best interests of not only the short-term needs of our business, but just as importantly, the longer-term needs of our business. So, you know, everyone really does need a coach, an accountability partner, a mentor to help provide varying perspectives on a situation, maybe see things from a different point of view, consider all options in decision-making. And, you know, it's an investment for certain, but it's an investment that most definitely pays off because you've got someone who's as invested in your business as you are and in, it, in its success, and they're helping you every step along the way, checking you, checks and balances, being a sounding board, bringing in additional resources if necessary, and so much more. Karen Kokanee with us. She is the she's a business and executive coach at Kokanee and Associates. Uh, Karen, at this point in time, people are uh, many people are still out of work. They're un, or they're unemployed, and uh, there may be opportunities to return to work. But a lot of these a lot of these employees that are unemployed are not are apprehensive about coming back to the workplace. Um, they're they're getting their unemployment benefits. They're getting still for uh, for at least in an interim the federal benefit as well. And it can be tough for these companies to recruit talent back to the office or to bring in new talent and convince them to come in. What are some what is some advice that you're giving to your clients to attract talent to come back to work or to come into work altogether at these look at these businesses? Another great question. It's you know it's so hard when people are receiving money for sitting at home and they're not very well incented to go back to work. So certainly uh, these government incentives have have definitely hurt businesses. But the thing is that people who are worth having part of the organization, they're out there, they're looking for a place to call home, if you will, where they can contribute and they can be rewarded for their contributions. You have to be the kind of business that attracts high talent. And that's another thing that a coach will help a business with. One of the, the things to do is to remain flexible, remain open. Sometimes businesses have to make the hard choices to let go of people who, who just aren't willing to go that extra mile. So we need to have a long-term view we need to prepare our businesses to be the kind of businesses that attract high talent, good talent. And then once we have the talent, we work with businesses to help retain those high performing individuals so we can increasingly set ourselves apart from the competition over time. Everything's a process, everything's a journey, and there are many things that we can do to be that kind of business. But again, it all starts with defining a strategy and understanding from sitting down and, and really understanding the goals and the targets from business owners or executive leaders, knowing where they want to go. And then we put together a very comprehensive strategy. And then literally all the things that we do once that's in place are in line with and in accordance with that strategy so that we can execute now and implement feet on the street at the feet on the street level to bring that strategy into realization and continuously stay ahead of the competition, attracting real talent and keeping real talent. We also have to stay innovative and Sometimes that means even creating new markets, which can be challenging, but it's possible. So many, many things that can be implemented. Karen, we are seeing politics trickle down into the business community. And with the world where it is right now in our nation, it can be so political and so divisive. 
what advice are you giving to business owners when it comes to addressing some of the issues in our country on the political spectrum? <laughs> if anybody has the key to that question, <laughs> let me know. It is, it is quite interesting, isn't it? And, and so divisive. Um, find the common ground. People are people. And at the end of the day, most people, most businesses, really want the same thing. Uh, it's results, you know, for people, it's, it's, it could be things like freedom, time, more time with their families. Same thing with business owners. Um, but first and foremost, they want results. The way to get to a goal is to come together, find the common ground. I wish we would do that on a, on a political platform, frankly, uh, but we can do that. And I work with my clients to just find, find the, the commonality, find the, the ways that we are all aligned. And then you strengthen that alignment, you strengthen that cohesiveness, you build leadership literally at every level of the organization so that people are learning to work with, even coach, mentor, be accountability partners to uh, one another. And that just strengthens the foundation from the bottom up, from the core up. You also have to have a strong set of values and principles that the business operates on. And again, aligning on these values and these principles, it sort of makes everything else moot, if that makes sense. And that is also a very, very much a guiding light for any decision making, resource management within the organization is when these principles and these core values are strongly and firmly in place, it makes everything else much more simple and it makes everything else much more fluid and it makes results come much more quickly. Karen, there's been so much innovation by our, our businesses, especially our retailers and our restaurants during the course of this pandemic as we're continuing forward through the rest of this pandemic and, and these businesses continue to innovate. What are you doing? What are you telling them to do in terms of uh, focusing on the details of those innovations and those pivots that they've made and, and how they can tailor those changes to in the future to continue to thrive with these changes down the, lo down the road when the pandemic is over? Well, first of all, I don't I don't work too much with retail type customers. It's it's pretty much everything but that. Um, it would be the same though with with any business. Uh, it's it's that resiliency, um, being close to the ground as far as listening to that customer base and what they're saying and what they're needing and what they're what they're hearing. Uh, also implementing things that make them have a better peace of mind, the customers that is, as they visit those establishments would be very important. Uh, making sure they have pure air. Uh, there are ways to purify the air so that when customers walk into an environment, they're, they know that they're, they can have peace of mind that they're going to be safe in those environments. It's true for any business. Make sure that you put your customers, your employees uh, first, that you care about them, talk to them, have uh, group meetings, get input. And it's not to say to let them take over, but certainly listen and be open to what they're saying and what their needs are. We have to remain flexible and just do our best to navigate through this time because it is an unknown. That's the best advice I can give. Karen, anything else for us? Any other lasting advice for these businesses as they go forward? I would say everyone needs a coach. And again, stay focused. Everyone needs a coach, you know, whether it's in sports, whether it's in business. A coach provides you with accountability, partnership. It provides you with perspective. It helps business owners and executive leaders see you as others see you, which is incredibly important. You know, everything starts with awareness and then the, the conversation goes from there. Uh, consider investing in a coach. 
it might just very well be the best investment that your business could ever make. Money, time, you've got it all. Investing in a coach will ensure that you're working on your business enough and not just in your business and ensure that week to week there's consistency, consistency and consistency in the focus and towards those ultimate goals so that they are realized over time. And it is a process. So miracles don't necessarily happen overnight. In fact, they don't usually. Business coaching ensures that we're taking those little steps in the right areas consistently, day after day, week after week, so that we're assured of getting phenomenal results and so that business not only, as I said earlier, survives, but it thrives. Karen, That's thank you very much for being with us today. You're welcome. If anyone wants further information, you can email me at karen at karenkokenny.com, and that's Karen with a Y, K-A-R-Y-N, at Karen Kokenny, K-A-R-Y-N-K-O-K-E-N-Y.com, and we'll give you further information or a free strategy session. Thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate the time. Appreciate having you on. Karen Kokenny, business and executive coach at Kokenny and Associates with us on the Oakland County Megacast. We're going to take a, a quick break. And when we return, we'll talk to a local medical student about her experiences at a major university during this time in our lives, as well as the recent experience that she had saving lives before she even puts on that white coat and calls herself doctor. We'll be back with that story and more coming up on the Oakland County Megacast. You're watching and listening on a family of TV and radio stations. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards. Back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart. Keep wearing a mask in public. And if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside Ronnie Dahl in the studios of 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV. In addition, today we are on the... Uh, Facebook page of West Bloomfield Parks as well as on Birmingham Area Municipal Access and 88.1 WBFH, the Biff in Bloomfield Hills and surrounding areas. We thank all of you for tuning in today to, to our program and if you're just tuning in now you can watch and listen to us live from 10 a.m. to 12 noon Monday through Friday here on our family of TV and radio stations as well as throughout the afternoon for replays and on demand on civiccentertv.com slash Megacast. Our next guest is a student at the Oakland University William Beaumont School of Medicine and recently had uh, an experience saving a life out in the field. Her name is Megan Brown. She joins us now on the Oakland County Megacast. Megan, thank you for being with us today. Hi, thank you guys for having me. Thank you for being on. How have you been over the course of the pandemic? Um, I've been good. I've kind of been, so I, like you said, I go to OUWB as we call it for short. Um, but I'm originally from Traverse City, Michigan, so I spent a lot of the time during the pandemic up north with my family. So, Megan, recently, while well, you were up north with your family, you had an experience when you were out grocery shopping uh, with somebody in distress. Tell us that story about how you sprung into action and helped this person. So, um, like I said, I was up north in Traverse City for most of the time, but my grandparents lived down in Oakland County um, in Rochester. and we were going down to do a grocery run for them, my mother and I, because they're elderly. Um, my grandpa has some history of lung issues, so we didn't want them leaving the house. And our family members, we kind of all took turns um, buying their groceries and going out and getting them household essentials. So it was our turn and we were down there at a local Kroger. Um, and when I tell this story, it's kind of, it just blows my mind how everything really lined up perfectly um, for this event to happen. So I'm very familiar with the store that I was at. I shop there often, but this particular day, um, I couldn't find some of the things on the list that I was looking for. So it took me a little bit longer than it normally would. 
Um, and once I finally got everything, uh, we were leaving the shopping center. And as we were pulling out, um, there was a man who was walking into one of the pharmacies down the street and he was kind of wobbling a little bit funny. He looked like he might be intoxicated and then he just collapsed to the ground. Um, and immediately I called 911, got a hold of the EMS personnel and they said, are you able to go assess him for injuries? Can you check if he has a pulse? And immediately I was like, yes, I can do that. With the pandemic going on, I put my mask on, I put on a pair of gloves and I kind of ran up to the man. His face had been turning bluish purple at that time. And I checked him, he had a laceration on the back of his head he was bleeding from and he unfortunately did not have a pulse at that time. So I updated the uh, emergency responders on what was going on and they said, do you know how to do CPR? We need you to initiate CPR immediately. So I said, yep, I am trained in this, I can do it. And I uh, performed CPR on him for about seven minutes until the EMS first responders arrived to the scene. So Megan, as a student, you were trained in this, but to do it in real life and during a pandemic, did you have any hesitation? Um, to be honest, it didn't even cross my mind. It, it was just something that I had to do. I felt like I had the responsibility. I knew what I was doing. I had to get out there and help him. So I just took the necessary precautions being in a pandemic. I put on my mask, I put on my gloves, but I didn't feel like there was any hesitation there. Um, but it was a really, it was, it was pretty cool to be able to do that outside of the hospital. I'd only done CPR once before, and that was in the hospital with surgical residents, um, attending physicians, nurses, staff, all supporting me and kind of instructing me um, the speed I should be going at and the amount of pressure I should be putting. Um, but this time, you know, I was kind of all on my own and it was a different experience for sure. So many things probably going through your head. Were you thinking of all of those steps? And then when you're in it, is it just the training taking over? And it's exhausting giving people CPR. I think the general public doesn't realize what goes into it. Yeah, you are using your whole body when you are, you know, putting that force on their chest to keep their heart beating. I would say there was a, definitely a lot going on in my mind at that time. Um, I know that I was mostly focused on keeping the pace and using the right amount of force. And I could tell that I was doing it correctly because I could see the blood flow returning to his face. He started to pink up a little bit. Um, and there was a lot going on. Once we started initiating CPR, some bystanders started coming up and I kind of just blocked them out and focused on helping the man and doing what I needed to do at that point. Megan, have you spoken to him since the situation? How is he doing? So I haven't spoken to him personally, but um, about a week and a half after the incident, his son actually reached out. He got my contact information from the first responders and he texted me thanking me for helping his dad. At that time he was doing he was doing well. He, um, since then, he had moved to a cardiac rehab facility, um, and I have spoken to the son again since then, but unfortunately, he had another cardiac event while he was in rehab and recently passed away. But his son was extremely grateful. He, he reiterated again that they were so thankful that I gave them a few extra months with their dad and they were able to, you know, have that time with him before he did pass. This experience, how has it changed you in your thought process for finishing med school? Or is this now you're all in? Well, I never really wanted to go into any emergent field. Emergency medicine wasn't something I was interested in. I always thought that I wouldn't be able to handle the pressure. Um, but after this, you know, I feel more confident. I actually just finished um, this week my emergency medicine rotation. So I felt a lot more comfortable going into that rotation and getting involved, doing some hands-on things with people coming into the emergency department. And another thing that a lot of medical students talk about, we discuss it a lot actually at our school, is imposter syndrome and kind of feeling like you don't have the training or you're not good enough to actually help. 
And after this event, I can say that I don't even have an ounce of imposter syndrome in me at all. I maybe did before, but now I know that my training has paid off and I feel very confident that if I were out in public again in another situation were to happen, that I would be able to help. I'm sure his family is so grateful that you were there at that exact moment to be able to help him. What has this been like to be a medical student during the middle of a pandemic? Um, it definitely has disrupted our training a little bit. Uh, like I said, I was up in Traverse City. A lot of our clinical training was over the internet. So it was via Zoom meetings such as this one, lectures online, um, telemedicine visits with patients. So it's definitely been disrupted in that way, but also um, in some other more unfortunate ways. Like I wanna go into ophthalmology and normally during July and August, we would be completing what's called an away rotation where we would be essentially auditioning at other hospitals for a position in their residency program. But this year, all of the away rotations are canceled. So it's been really hard to kind of connect with other programs and, you know, show them who I am as a student and future physician. Megan Brown with us on the Oakland County Megacast on a family of TV and radio stations. Uh, in terms of plans for the fall, you do, uh, my notes do say that you graduate medical school next year. Do you believe that, uh, that, that uh, in the fall it's going to be a little more difficult, even now with all the different changes in place at many universities and the preparations that they have to continue forward a, as much as normal as possible as a medical student or, uh, or do you believe that with what you've already experienced and what the university's already been through in terms of adjusting for these classes that it's going to be business as usual? Um, I think it's going to be a little bit of both. So my school personally, Oakland University William Beaumont School of Medicine has been really great at trying to accommodate us and helping us get through this difficult time. They've offered us online courses for fourth year credit that helps ease our load a little bit. And this year, um, like you said, I'll be graduating in May of 2021, which means this fall I'll be interviewing for residency positions. And they've already determined that all of those interviews are going to be virtual such as this one. So that's definitely gonna be different from, from the usual, but I think they have us back in the hospital again working and um, a lot of a lot more protective um, personal protective equipment that we need to wear but other than that it fa feels fairly normal to get back and I'm glad to be back and working in the hospital again well Megan we thank you very much for joining us today thank you so much for having me it's been a pleasure we appreciate it Megan Brown she's a student at Oakland University's William Beaumont School of Medicine and we thank her for being on with us today we're gonna take a quick break and when we return we'll talk about how people in the community can help those who are facing food insecurity in the midst of a pandemic. We'll speak to someone from Gleaner's Food Bank. That and more coming up. You are watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast on a family of TV and radio stations. Ronnie and I will return after this break. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call, from my COVID help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Hi, I'm Dr. Faust, the medical director for the Oakland County Health Division. The most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often. Follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands. Step one, turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water. Step two, apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, rinse your hands with warm, clean water. And step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel 
paper towel or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. For handheld faucets, turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. Go to oakgov.com health or call Nurse on Call at 1-800-848-5533 to learn more. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe, alongside Ronnie Dahl on our family of TV and radio stations, including Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99 in West Bloomfield, Kegel Harbor, Sylvan Lake and Orchard Lake on Civic Center TV. In addition, we're on Birmingham Area Municipal Access, those same two TV channels, Comcast 15 and AT&T 99. In Birmingham, Bingham Farms, Beverly Hills, and the Village of Franklin. In addition, today, as always, we're on 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake, West Bloomfield, Kego Harbor, Sylvan Lake, and 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills. And today, our Facebook partner is West Bloomfield Parks, facebook.com slash WBParks. Give them a like and thank them for joining us today on the Oakland County Megacast as we have a Facebook partner each and every day on the program talking about a variety of topics in regards to COVID-19 and other top stories in the local area. And during this time, it's, uh, it's really tough for a lot of people to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic uh, as it varies from regular situations. And that creates situations where people are in more... Of, uh, in a variety of financial difficulties during this time that may that may lead to certain problems or they or they're facing food insecurity from regular times and that's exacerbated further by this COVID-19 pandemic and we're now joined we're pleased to be joined by the vice president of community giving and public relations at Gleaners Food Bank to talk about that Stacy Averill joins us now on the Oakland County Megacast Stacy thank you for being with us today hi thank you so much for having me we appreciate it how are you how's the team at Gleaners Food Bank doing we're doing well, you know, we're, we're busy. We're working hard. We're making sure that we're giving uh, as much support as we can to the community during this, this really uncertain and difficult time. So food donation is still uh, going on during this time. You're still accepting food donations. How has that process changed over the course of the pandemic at, uh, for safety purposes? And has that affected the donations at all? Yeah, so most of the donations we're still accepting are, are through our the relationships we've built with um, farmers and wholesalers and retailers and those types of things. Um, most of our food drive efforts, so physical food donations, we've kind of put a halt on um, so that our team uh, internally can really focus on distributing food out to the community. Um, but we are we are doing some work with community partners in terms of food donations. Um, and a lot of what we're doing is purchasing food in order to make sure that we've got all the different um, nutrition that will make well-rounded um, meals possible. And um, what we've seen since the pandemic start is truly a community coming together to support this issue. Uh, and and it's, been, it's been heartwarming uh, to be on the recipient of that, to have the community really back the work that we're doing and, and trust gleaners to um, get those nutritious food items out into the community. It's It's been a, a great response and, and we've been able to do more because of it. So, uh, so that's been really wonderful. Stacy, the need has been so great during this time. Do you anticipate it may increase as that additional federal unemployment money goes away? So we are seeing projections from Feeding America, which is our uh, the National um, Association of Food Banks. Uh, they are projecting in our service area a 5% increase to food insecurity due to the pandemic. Um, and we are seeing an increased need. We are seeing numbers go up. Um, you know, right now, uh, or before COVID, there were um, about just over 550,000 uh, individuals in our service area that are food insecure. And those projections that Feeding America has put out there could mean that an additional 212,000 people are food insecure um, now because of, because of unemployment, um, displaced workers, um, uh, families with children. I mean, the, the kids have been out of school since mid-March. 
Um, normally at this time of year, there are families struggling to put food on the table because kids are out of school, but, but that's been extended because the kids have been out of school since mid-March. So there's a number of different household types that are struggling right now, um, even more so than, than they would have been at this time of year um, before the pandemic. Um, another population that we've seen an increased need is um, those who are homebound. So um, seniors uh, and, and patients and those with disabilities. Um, there's a number of people who, who aren't able to go to the grocery store um, you know, when they can uh, or when they need to get food or aren't able to, to go to a distribution site. And so we've, we've pivoted to uh, provide as much support to those populations as well. Stacey Averill with us on the Oakland County Megacast. She is the Vice President of Community Giving and Public Relations at Gleaners Food Bank. So with that being the case, where there's going to be uh, projected to be more food insecure people as we move forward with federal unemployment benefits <coughs> set to expire, are our local food banks able to account for that and continue to provide the service to people that they have already been providing service to, but also account for this uptick in potentially more food food insecure people in our communities and what community help is needed further in order to bridge any gaps that may be present so the what we've done since this increased need has has hit the uh, community and this the pandemic hit in mid-march is we've increased the output that the of the food distributions that we've done so um as soon as we uh were aware of the state of emergency and the schools were closed we started working um, to sign up new distribution sites. So since mid-March, we've launched 70 new drive-through distribution sites. And those are there to, to your point, to meet that increased need. And it is our intention to keep working those new additional distribution sites um, for as long as we can. And so that means through the summer and into the fall uh, for sure and, and possibly beyond. Um, we, on top of that work, uh, we work with 500 partner agencies in the community. So soup kitchens, shelters, um, schools, et cetera. That work is continuing. So we've, we've um, continued the, the standard work that we do day in and day out throughout the year. Um, but we've added these increased distributions. We also have um, put together 120 partners that we um, uh, leverage and, and work with to distribute boxes. So that's to the population, the homebound senior population and um, healthcare patients and, and other vulnerable populations that can't necessarily get to these additional mobiles that we've put in place. So, you know, this increased work that we've put in place to help meet that need, um, is possible because of the community and, and the support that we're getting from, from our donors and from the community um, with, with dollars that allow us to buy additional food, to staff those mobiles, and to make sure that our operations continue um, effectively and safely. Stacy, I know your organization has relied a lot in the past on volunteers. How has that program changed during this pandemic? So we, when, when the pandemic first hit, we uh, shut down our, our, most of our volunteer efforts. We wanted to make sure that we were um, keeping things as safe as possible, both for the, the volunteers that typically come, but also for our staff. Um, and uh, we've opened that up a little bit. We have volunteer opportunities um, at our, our Pontiac location right now, and we need some support there. Uh, to build these boxes that I was talking about. So we have opened up some of our volunteer opportunities. Um, there are other locations that have continued to have volunteers in support, but you're right. Um, we, we for the past number of years, we have relied on tens of thousands of volunteers to come in and help us. So what we've had to do is we've hired temporary staff to fill that work and, and we've, and we've, you know, had to add in an additional expense in order to cover that. Uh, but we, we've done it because we wanna make sure that we, again, we, you know, we continue these, these operations. We, the, the need is so great. So continuing this work and making sure that we're doing it in um, an effective way um, has meant for us hiring some temporary staff to, to make that happen. 
Uh, Stacy, if more people in the community want to get involved as time goes on, what are some of the best ways that people can get involved on top of donating to help with all these services that are absolutely necessary and are going to be even more necessary for our communities as time goes on throughout this pandemic? Sure. So the, one of the things that I would um, ask everyone to do is connect with us um, on social media. We've got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, connect with us on our website. Take a look at our website. Get engaged. Sign up for newsletters. Um, one of the things that would be outside of, of donations, um, keep in touch with us and learn about what's going on and learn about what we're doing and help us spread the word. There's, um, you know, there is going, we are going to continue to need support over time. Um, and so staying engaged with us will help you better understand what support that is. And so when we are able to reach out and ask for it, um, you'll be right there ready to, ready to support. And as always, um, spreading the word is going to be extremely helpful because um, we could use as much collaborative effort as possible. Stacey, one of the concerns that may, that may be out there that's just a natural concern of donating food and, and, and delivering that to other people is the safety of the of the operation from point A to point Z. Where how what is Gleaners doing to ensure that the staff and the volunteers that are working to create these boxes and to organize this food and that the food itself also is safe before it's being distributed? Absolutely. We have put in safety precautions across the board, um, just just like anyone else, um, you know, uh, ramped up cleaning uh, schedules and, and ensured PPE wear and, and socially distancing all of the work that we're doing. Many of the things have been um, rearranging our workspaces and the volunteer spaces to ensure that all of those things are happening throughout the entire shift. Um, we're only allowing so many people in spaces at a specific time to make sure that we've got, um, you know, socially distanced work going on. So we are really proud of the the team's effort to continue to make sure that uh, all of the working environments that we have um, and and the safety of the food um, is 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 um, kept uh, top notch. We we. Food safety and volunteer and state uh, staff safety is utmost importance to us because um, you know we we can't continue to do this this great work and this necessary work um, without without those safety precautions in place. Stacy, COVID nineteen has definitely been chaotic for all of us, but we have seen and talked with people and organizations that have had to change things that have turned out to be for the positive. Has there been any of those changes for gleaners that post pandemic, post pandemic you may think will carry on? Oh, absolutely. We've, um, we've, there's a couple of different things. So we've um, adapted some of our, our distribution models at a larger scale. We've established brand new partnerships that um, that we hadn't had in the first place, and those partnerships are going to continue, um, and and that only means great things. Um, we've also established uh, more means of communication. So, and uh, and that's not just internal communication to make sure things are running effectively, but it's also communication with our stakeholders and with our donors, and keeping keeping um, everyone up to date about the the work that's going on and the, and what um, their support is enabling. So, absolutely, there's a number of different things that. Um, you know that we've put in place because of the pandemic that we will we will leverage um, continuously. Stacy, anything else that's important for us to know? Any, any other information you'd like the audience to know before we let you go today? Um, I would say the only other piece is that um, is to let the audience know that that support is available and it's available in your community. Um, Hunger is is not it does not discriminate. There is food insecurity in every community that we serve, every city that we serve, every county that we serve. Um, and so, if you or um, if somebody that you know is in need, um, go to our website gcfb.org um, or call two one one. There is a distribution near you that that you can receive food support, and um, we are here for that. Uh, so don't wait if you need support. Um, find a location and come get food support now because we want to make sure that we're 
helping you take hunger off the table and um, and getting back on your feet as soon as possible. Stacy, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Appreciate it. We appreciate it. Stacy Abril, the Vice President of Community Giving and Public Relations at Gleaners Food Bank with us on the Oakland County Megacast. So many different ways to get involved with with helping organizations like Gleaners Food Bank in our community. There's so many organizations that are working to help bridge this, this gap between those with food insecurities and, and those that are doing okay in our community, especially in times like this. We're finding safe food at and uh, with, uh, in a time where people are struggling to put food on the table is so critical. I've been a part of a few volunteer opportunities at Gleaners. They are doing amazing work through that organization because when you're hungry, it impacts so many other parts of your life. Think about the kids. They can't study. They can't concentrate. So this is such a needed service. And I think we're seeing during this crisis so many people were too proud to reach out for help, and that is not the situation here. You want to go ahead, the service is there, and reach out. I will say one thing about Gleaners, too. If you don't want to donate food, you can't donate food. If you donate money, they're able to purchase food in bulk at a much cheaper price than would you than you would be able to get going to your local local grocery store. So there are a lot of different ways that you can support this organization and support our entire community as well. They do amazing work and we thank Stacy and, the enti- and their entire team for having uh, Stacy on with us today. We'll take a quick break. We'll go through today's top headlines and then we'll talk about sports injuries, orthopedic surgery and more with Dr. Ronald Letterman and talk later on with State Senator Rosemary Bayer here on the Oakland County Megacast. We thank you for tuning in. We'll be back after this quick break. You are watching and listening to us on our family of TV and radio stations. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so. Those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Oakland County Clerk Lisa Brown here with some important reminders about voting. Always use a blue or black ink pen when completing your ballot. Fill in the box next to your choice. Don't use an X, check mark, or circle your choice. In the August primary, don't cross party lines. Under Michigan election law, you can only vote for one party's candidates. Otherwise, your ballot will be spoiled and the partisan section won't count. Don't forget to check both sides of your ballot and vote the nonpartisan section. If you want to vote absentee, send a written request to your city or township clerk. Your ballot must be returned to your city or township clerk's office by 8 p.m. election night. And be sure to sign and date the outer envelope. If you spilled coffee on your ballot or made a mistake, you can ask your city or township clerk to cancel that ballot and issue a new one. Please don't use whiteout. If you already returned your absentee ballot and want to change your vote, you need to contact your city or township clerk no later than 4 p.m. the day before the election. Thank you for taking part in our democratic process. Welcome back. You're watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast on our family of TV and radio stations. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside Ronnie Dahl in the studios of Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. In addition, today we're on Birmingham Area Municipal Access and 88.1 WBFH, The Biff. And today our Facebook partner is West Bloomfield Parks. We thank them for joining us. Facebook.com slash WB Parks joining us today via Facebook Live as we continue to provide you with the latest news and information from around the Oakland County area on the coronavirus, COVID-19 pandemic, and other uh, top news stories 
in the local area this week, Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 12 noon on a family of TV and radio stations, and every day on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, where today our top story, casinos given the green light to reopen, new restrictions are in place as well for up north. Governor Gretchen Whitmer gave the go-ahead Wednesday to Detroit's three casinos to open at 15% capacity beginning on August 5th. The casinos were ordered closed in Mar March because of the coronavirus pandemic, but Governor Whitmer is also dialing back economic reopening in northern Michigan, reducing the size of groups allowed to gather and banning indoor alcohol sales in nightclubs and other establishments that most that mostly serve alcohol with little food. Those changes go into effect this week Friday and and Ronnie's continued stringent re regulations being put in place by Governor Gretchen Whitmer as the state continues to see the, this this little spike we're in that maybe had hit a little bit of a plateau continue to have little blips here and there and it's a cause for concern because of the and we'll talk about this in a couple more headlines down the line the positivity rate of cases is still in, at a concerning level one of the issues i think with up north is we are heading into the end of summer a lot of people still trying to get their vacations in before the kids go back to school if they go back to school trying to figure all of that out but also it plays into whether or not the students are going to be able to be allowed back into the classroom it's going to continue to have a factor on how schools go about their learning in the fall whether it be elementary middle and high schools or even our local colleges and universities which transitions us into our next headline on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus michigan state students living on campus test positive for COVID 19 multiple msu students living at holmes hall have tested positive for the coronavirus an email was sent to students living in the building on monday alerting them to positive cases students who tested positive are self-isolating and the university is working closely with the ingham county health department to reach out to anyone who may have had close contact with those infected holmes hall has been used as one of the university's summer housing locations and on-campus residents who test positive have the choice of self-isolating either at their off-campus permanent resident a residence or designated university self-isolation space on campus so this is an interesting experiment here uh, unfortunately of course these students were have contracted COVID-19 but this brings up a question for the fall of how do you deal with outbreaks in the dorms uh, whether it be a couple of people or be an entire floor or be an entire building to keep that the population of healthy people in that building those without COVID-19 safe there has been some discussion that msu may be uh rerouting some housing from acres hall on the on the uh east side of the campus for specific covid 19 housing uh, that hasn't been made officially so yet but there are discussions in place and it'll be interesting to see what michigan state university and our other local universities do in terms of maintaining the ability for these students to learn and be on campus uh, in the fall and beyond when they're learning at these universities, but also keep the other populations in the dorms safe when that's such a close contact area. This is going to continue to be an issue that's going to play out on college campuses across the nation as more and more students return. I believe Eastern Michigan University is now offering dorms that are going to be single person dorms, but they're going to also have to figure out what are they going to do with the eating halls, places of that nature, this is going to be a lot for the college campuses to handle. Yeah, I think about locations on Michigan State's campus that ha that are in the dorm communities that have high populations at all times of the day and, and places like the Snyder Phillips Gallery Eating uh, Dining Hall and even the Dining Hall at Holmes Hall, those places are packed no matter what time of day you're at, especially, especially in the afternoons and right at 12 noon. That's going to that's gonna be really tough to navigate for these universities as students are on a variety of different schedules and they are going to have to take the time to get those meals in and do these other activities uh, on campus and maintain social distancing. It'll be interesting to see where our universities go from there. So these new regulations that are in place, these adjustments that Governor Whitmer announced this morning are a result of new coronavirus cases. Uh, Michigan confirmed 996 new cases of the disease on Wednesday, including 300 older cases from a backlog of test results from a commercial lab. 
The overall case tally surpassed 80,000 no known cases on Wednesday as well, according to the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. The percentage of positive coronavirus tests in Michigan has been gradually increasing since June, and the positivity rate is currently at 3.2% as of Tuesday. So we continue to see this rate, this rise in the positivity rate. That's what's the main concern. It sounded like from Tuesday's press conference from Dr. Jone Caldun as that 3% benchmark of positivity is, is the point where the CDC says anything under that is, is you're pretty safe from community spread, but 3% and over, it shows some evidence of community spread. And that has been that buzzword that the buzz term that Governor Whitmer has said for several weeks now it's going to determine how we move forward. If there is evidence of community spread, she's going to be extra cautious. Testing is up. They're doing a lot more testing now as we go forward. So, of course, you're going to have more positive results. However, it is that percentage that they are using to help determine whether or not we move forward to phase five. All those stories and more, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, as well as links to reputable resources about COVID-19 in your hometown in Oakland County in the state of Michigan and on the federal level. All of that, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. While we're in the thick of the summer, people are out, people are active, people are trying to figure out ways to live a healthy lifestyle, to get that physical activity in while the gyms are still closed and driving everyone nuts. But some people maybe need to take some extra precautions to keep their body safe, and many people may be getting injured and avoiding going to a doctor out of concerns. And, and joining us now to ease those concerns is an orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine doctor at Letterman Quarterwitz Center for Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, Dr. Ronald Lennerman, joins us once again on the Oakland County Megacast. Dr. Letterman, thank you for being with us today. Oh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me back. We appreciate having you on since we last spoke. How are you doing? How's your team doing at uh, Letterman Quartowitz? Our team is doing fantastic. And um, patients are coming in more frequently, or I should say more and more patients. We're not up to 100%. But I mentioned earlier that at Letterman Quartowitz uh, Center for Orthopedics, we stayed open even when most practices completely shut their doors. And we went to great lengths to ensure the safety of our staff and our patients. Uh, and, and so we're used to seeing patients, everybody is mandated to wear a mask. We are sterilizing the office before and after each patient with hospital grade uh, cleaning equipment. And our whole goal was to stay open to prevent, uh, to prevent people from having to go to the hospital and the emergency room where there were more serious things uh, re required there and they were able to come to our office for their sports injuries, for their broken ankles or wrists, or inflamed arthritic joints. Uh, and our goal was to de minimize the burden on the hospital systems. Dr. Letterman, yesterday we spoke with a couple of other doctors in the local area, Dr. David Donaldson from Beaumont, Beaumont Troy ER, Dr. Manu Malhotra from Henry Ford West Bloomfield, about concerns that people have had in the, in the past throughout this pandemic and even some recently about going and getting treated by their doctor, or going to the hospital uh, because they're afraid of catching the coronavirus in the process and some of the negative effects that that can have down the line if you're not getting these issues treated as soon as possible. In terms of orthopedics and, and sports medicine, there have been people that have been apprehensive maybe to go to the doctor. Have you been seeing as they are coming back now and have delayed getting treated on some of those issues that those have those lingering effects that maybe people should be cautious about uh, when they maybe are apprehensive to go see the doctor? That's a great point and thank you for bringing that up. If somebody has hurt themselves and within a day or two, it's not feeling much better after they've done the typical Tylenol or Advil and ice and resting it, then yes, you'd want to get evaluated. We have availability every day, all day. We're in the Lakes Medical Center in West Bloomfield. We have patients that will come to us from all over Southeast Michigan. And the important reason to be seen is that a more serious problem is not uh, missed or overlooked or ignored, whether it be a stress fracture or a torn ligament, or for somebody who has arthritis and the joint is severely inflamed because they might have gone out and, and overdone it, then you can jump on it. And the sooner you can get to an acute injury or an acute inflammation, the better chance you have of getting it under control quickly. What are some, what are some complications that can 
arise from not getting that those injuries tr treated quickly. If people continue to put stress on those muscles and those ligaments and those joints uh, because they're feeling a little bit of pain, but it's not a major amount of pain and they don't go, want to go see the doctor or take that time to get that checked out. Right. Well, I can tell you that patients that have admitted to me and all of my colleagues, Dr. Porterwitz, Dr. O'Keefe, Dr. Hyman, we have many doctors in the practice and even our physical therapists, they say, if, if I wish I had come in sooner because I was so fearful of going to a doctor's office, but we set up a screening table outside of our office in the lobby of the Lakes Medical Center. And there we take temperatures on patients. We provide masks and gloves and uh, the screening questionnaire. And once they come into the office where everything is spread out and we're able to physically distance, they feel so much better and they wish they had come sooner. To answer your question, if, if you miss a torn ligament, say in your ankle, and you continue to go out there walking on the trail or trying to jog, you can have a second injury that ends up being worse. If somebody has a stress fracture, it's better to shut things down and rest it for a short period of time than for that fracture to go undiagnosed and then they're two, three months down the road and still hobbling. A good example is someone who did have a non-displaced broken bone in the ankle. They thought it was an ankle sprain, but by the time we saw them two, three months later, the bone started healing in the wrong position. So those are the kind of things you want to avoid. Is there a way to provide some of your physical therapy services or other therapies via the internet or Zoom like we're seeing at other hospitals and with other doctors? Yes, and I never thought physical therapy could be offered virtually, but it can be. And we're actually looking into new technologies that can use some of the, uh, the, the great technology with the Google glasses and the virtual realities to be able to provide that in a, in a whole other level. But for right now, the patients that have come to me and said that they had uh, Zoom virtual physical therapy and our therapist would spend an hour with them going through different exercises and maneuvers and explaining to them how to do it correctly. I, I was amazed, as were the patients, at how much better they felt. So fortunately at Letterman Portowitz, we do offer virtual physical therapy, but we've expanded the therapy department. We've spread out the areas where we can work with our patients, and they seem to be, at least most, 95% are very comfortable coming in and getting the hands-on therapy. But yes, we can provide virtual physical therapy. Whoever thought that? Dr. Letterman, people are getting back outside more often now. We're in the thick of the summer. They've been out there running, playing basketball, uh, lifting weights outside, and uh, playing on the playgrounds, whatever they may be doing, physical activity and stay active during these summer months. And some people are even engaging in in-home workouts for the first time as gyms have remained closed in the state of Michigan. Um, at, at your office in particular, what are you seeing or what are you hearing from your colleagues in the field in terms of potential injuries that people are developing uh, when they are engaging in these programs, maybe for the first time, not going at the right pace, not practicing proper form, and what can people at home be cautious of to prevent these common injuries? The, the rule of that whole scenario is to take it slow. I mean, how about this weather? It's magnificent. We've had 80 degree and sunshine weather for a month, two months, and everybody wants to be outside. And who thinks they can hurt themselves walking? But if somebody goes from sedentary after getting through our wonderful Michigan winters and has this weather where they can be outside for hours at a time and walk or jog, you end up with these overuse syndromes, meaning tendonitis, inflamed joints, uh, heel pain, back pain, all of the different joints in your body if you jump into it too aggressively. So if people are, are starting to hurt because they're out there with these overuse syndromes, it's actually a good time to come in, get evaluated, make sure it's nothing serious, which it usually isn't. It often does not require surgery. And I will tell you that another reason patients are afraid to go to an orthopedic surgeon's office is because they're afraid the minute they walk through the door, it's, it means they're gonna be signed up for surgery. We're actually quite the opposite. We do everything we can to keep patient, our patients out of the OR, out of the operating room. But come in, get evaluated. Sometimes we'll have our physical therapists work with our patients just once or twice. 
show them the proper form so they can get back out there and enjoy what they're doing. But absolutely, we're seeing overuse issues. We're seeing less uh, severe violent injuries from the high school and college uh, organized sports like football and baseball. But a lot of kids are out there. I ride my bike almost every day and I'm going through different parks and you see the baseball fields where the, the community baseball programs are, are in full swing, pardon the pun. And these kids are out there playing baseball, Little League. And so we're still seeing those injuries. Dr. Ronald Letterman with us. He's an orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine doctor at Letterman, Letterman Quarterwitz Center for Orthopedics and Sports Medicine in West Bloomfield. So uh, you mentioned sports at various levels from amateur and, and youth to professional sports. And in this, in this t these times we're in, sports are experiencing a bit of a start and stop because of the coronavirus, keeping those precautions in place. Uh, we've seen in situations like in Major League Baseball, the Miami Marlins had to shut down a game because of a coronavirus outbreak. Michigan State's football team has shut down practices for multiple weeks as they've had positive cases uh, on their team. It's the start and stop of their training. And in some cases like football where high school teams are maybe not getting physical just yet uh, in an abundance of caution, could that start and stop motion and that tenderness in training when you do get back into full game action are you expecting to see more injuries in the fall from high school and mi middle school sports and even professional sports because of the times we're in the circumstances that we're in surrounding training and physical activity while preventing the coronavirus yes i do anticipate seeing more injuries it'll be very curious to see when the NBA starts, how many of these players are gonna end up with meniscus tears in their knees or Achilles tendon ruptures in football. I think that, you know, football's a violent sport, obviously, but there's something about practices, game preparation. And like you said, if they're not going along their normal protocol, on one hand, you can argue that there'll be less wear and tear, at least at the professional level but I anticipate seeing more injuries. Uh, Dr. Letterman, just a couple, another couple minutes with you uh, before we have to let you go. Anything else that you would feel would be important for us to touch on with you today or anything else that you'd like to say before we say goodbye? Well, yes, um, I do want to mention a critical uh, segment of our population is uh, the elderly and how, you know, age is just a number. Mm -hmm. But I think about our patients that are and I'm, get, I'm getting right there, you know, between 60 and 95. And the patients that live in either community retirement centers, nursing homes, these are the people that have been petrified to come in, to go to a doctor's office. And when we see them, they are so thankful that they can be seen safely and that they can be rendered the treatment that they've been putting off and therefore living in unnecessary pain. So we've talked a lot about sports a lot about the middle school, high schoolers, the college athletes, the professional athletes, people like you and I who might want to get out there, the weekend warriors. But our aging population uh, that might have normal wear and tear or arthritis or have a history of shoulder, knee, ankle, neck and back issues, they don't have to be afraid to come in because we can help make them feel better between our physical therapy or our regenerative stem cell, uh, PRP program, laser treatments, all of these things that can be offered to these patients without undergoing surgery, without having to worry about going to a hospital or, or anywhere else for surgery. So that's important. Let people know who are really afraid to leave their home that they can feel comfortable coming to us and be treated. And our, our whole motto is we get people better faster. And we do it often without surgery. Dr. Letterman, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Dr. Ronald Letterman from Letterman Quartowitz Orthopedics and Sports Medicine with us on the Oakland County Megacast. We'll take a quick break, and when we return, we'll talk about education, the response to COVID-19, and uh, what's going to go on with our upcoming elections with State Senator Rosemary Bayer from Michigan's 12th District. That coming up on the Oakland County Megacast. You're watching and listening to us on our family of TV and radio stations. Ronnie and I will return after this quick break. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards. 
back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart. Keep wearing a mask in public. And if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside Ronnie Dahl in the studios at Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. We're live streaming online, civiccentertv.com and lakesfm.com, as well as on the Facebook page of West Bloomfield Parks, facebook.com slash WB Parks. Go ahead and give them a like. And while we're at it, go to Civic Center, go to facebook.com slash Civic Center TV 15 and give us a like as well. And join us each and every day, Monday through Friday, from 10 a.m. to 12 noon, as we continue to bring the latest news and information about the coronavirus pandemic and other top stories in our area by speaking to a number of local guests and statewide guests about these very complicated topics. And, man, there's so much complicated topics that are in play right now in the state of Michigan as the coronavirus pandemic continues to progress forward as we get ready to go back to school in the fall and as we prepare for next week's primary elections and the November general elections and to talk to us about all of those topics we are joined now by State Senator Rosemary Bayer from Michigan's 12th district with us once again on the Oakland County Megacast. Senator Bayer thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much Tyler I appreciate you being asked again. Yeah, I love appreciate, it. appreciate having you back. How have you been since we last spoke? Busy. <laughs> yeah, don't, be, very busy. A few things going on. Yeah. yeah but there's a few small things happening. Yeah, just it, it's uh, we're, we're just a little busy right now, just a little bit of a critical time that we're in. So the uh, COVID-19 response from the state of Michigan continues to be very stringent. Governor Whitmer just this morning, uh, or just late last night, had announced some more stringent regulations on top of what was already in place in northern Michigan and throughout the state of Michigan in terms of uh, social gatherings. What's your evaluation on the governor's decision making in recent weeks in regards to COVID-19? Do you believe that the response has continued to be going at a proper pace or are we st sort of stagnating and getting uh, things back to some so semblance of normalcy? Uh, you know, we, of course, it, you know, we were all really excited because we were in, we've gotten ourselves to such a great spot, right? We really were kind of had we had the best rating in the whole country, actually, for a little while. And uh, I think we got overconfident, maybe, or maybe people are just tired of the whole thing. And so, you know, a little bit of resistance flares up and people won't wear masks and, and or follow the distancing rules. And so we see the, the numbers creeping back up. I, I think that one of the great things about the model that the governor put in place for us here is the ability to adjust as needed, right? So one, two, we can react quickly as things change, but also very targeted. So we, you know, with the data that's coming in and the analysis that happens every single day, the, the, we can pinpoint, right? Our governor can pinpoint the response. It says, this has to change today and this doesn't, or we can make something better over here. And I think that's really the best opportunity for all of us. You can look at your area you can look at you know does this change impact me and is there something i can do that maybe would keep that from getting worse or maybe even make it better right if we can get our own communities to participate and you know wear masks wear masks wear masks we can't even say that enough but um uh, that's our that's our those are our best tools for for getting through this in the healthiest possible way but i think she's doing a great job at responding quickly and we can always go back right i mean we're just we're going to be able to constantly ebb and flow as needed 
Senator Bayer, as we prepare in a couple of weeks to send our kids back to school, we've seen um, several different points of contention from our school, from from our schools, and from teachers as well. Um, in recent weeks, uh, Detroit, the, the Detroit school district, was required by the fe by the courts to test all of its 600 plus students in their summer school programs. Do you believe that kids should have to be tested? for coronavirus before they go back to in-person learning in the fall in the state of Michigan? Well, if we had the means, the ability to do at-home testing every morning that takes like 15 minutes, and then you know whether you should go out that day or not, once we get there, then it makes sense to me. I, To be honest, you know, testing before school starts, there's such a lag, even in the time you get your test drawn to the time you get the results then there's school some days later and in all that time something could have happened and then the minute you walk into the school you could get infected yet i mean I saw, you know the, the the way we test right now is not really support the notion that it makes sense to test all the kids before they go to school the way it is now actually it is feasible you know if this goes on a long time that we could get to the point where we can do a quick you know, at home pin brick or spit test or something and, and test yourself in the morning and don't go to work if you're sick. Work at home if you're sick. Don't go to school if you're sick. Go to school at home if you're sick. I mean, that, you know, we could get to that point. I don't know if we'll need to or not. Can you talk a little bit about mm -hmm. the bill to pause standardized testing right now for the kids? Well, uh, I'm, I'm one of the sponsors. <laughs> I believe in pausing. Standardized testing. I think one of the things that we want to focus on in Lansing is all the supports and protections and enablers that we can give to our educators, our education system, to allow them to try to teach. I think that should be our priority. So things that don't allow them to connect with their students who are, you know, actually been really challenged right over these last months the separation has been very painful in a lot of ways and we know there's been beyond the usual makeup time there's actually other mental issues that go along with not seeing people and not being involved it's isolation it happens to seniors and kids all of us um, so we want to support them in the work of bringing the kids back to school and teaching them not in the time and the disruption it takes to do testing or for really, there's more to it than that. We should suspend third grade reading laws. We should suspend teacher evaluations. We need to suspend or change the way we count for funding from the state, right? We count based on seats and your know, butts and seats, sorry, butts and seats on a specific day. That makes no sense this year. So there's a whole bunch of things that we've always, that we've been doing for a while. And in this, you know, there's reason for those things, but at this time, we need to pause things that do not support teaching our kids, support our teachers to do that. That's, that's anything else we can find that we could suspend. We want to do that, too. Senator Rosemary Bayer with us from Michigan's 12th District. Senator, this week we've seen uh, large-scale protests from teachers' unions in the state of Michigan about returning to in-person learning in the fall, many arguing that it's not going to be a safe situation for themselves or for the students. Um, what, what's, what are your thoughts on that situation? Do you believe that it is that we are at a point where it would be safe for in-person learning? Should we be pushing more for virtual learning? And would the state be able to, at that point, without federal aid, support that and be able to provide the means to these school districts to provide those means to their students to learn virtually in those situations? Well, you know, that's a very long question. First of all, I don't think I don't know that we have the means to support education in any form right now for this coming year. Um, the revenue expectations for the decline in revenue for this year in the school aid fund are significant. It's over a billion dollars um, to even to be able to support what we did last year. We, we don't have the funds for that. And one of the things we know is whatever model turns out to be the, the one that your district chooses, whether it's full-time in person, whether it's hybrid model or whether it's full-time at home, all of those things are gonna cost more than they did last year. So we don't have the money that we had last year. We for sure don't have the money to do more than that, right? So we must continue to push on the federal government to get some support for our education system 
just to be able to have school. It's really, you know, that's it's that it's that black and white almost. So um, the the other problem, you know, I'm on mostly budget committees. We've talked about that before. The school aid budget is by far the biggest chunk of our discretionary spending in the state. So you we can't even really steal enough <laughs> from the other budgets, even if that was appropriate. Um, to find a way to make up for it is really hard. I, I, it is the primary focus, I think, in all the budget meetings that I've had and the conversations I've had. It's, you know, there's health of people and education. Those are the top two things. So everyone is trying to find a way, uh, but we are really short on money for, for how to do this. Uh, so the first question, part of the question was whether it's safe for teachers. And I, you know, I think that that is still in question, to be honest. I, I know the most recent study I, I read shows that kids are spreaders of the disease and the taller you are, the more likely adults are to catch it from you. Um, that young, young kids are less contagious perhaps for adults because they're so much shorter and their breath is lower down than we typically. Now I will say, having been in lower elementary classes, I have sat on the floor with kids and teachers who sit on the floor with kids all the time. So I don't even know if the height thing is gonna work. So I don't know that we know the answer yet. And I think that's part of why there is yet no rigid uh, rule on how we do school this fall. And right now it is still, and maybe it will stay this way because it's more local. Just like the governor is using the regions in the state to make determinations locally, even down to the city level, even down to a neighborhood almost, um, on where you are on that on that spectrum of, of uh, COVID protections. The same thing for school districts, right? Depending on your environment, you, it's good that you have some flexibility over what's the right thing for the kids there and the teachers there. So I don't know that we're ever gonna have a, you know, everybody must do this. I, we might, I mean, if it gets bad, who knows, right? Um, we certainly shut the schools down early in the year, so. There's the, I don't think we know, and that's why there's no. That's why there's nothing more definitive, and why you see in West Bloomfield, of course, the, the the model plan now is all online in Ann Arbor. It's all online. I think there's going to be a mix of schools that are. All, I had one superintendent I talked to the other day who said they are going to be all in person. Um, it's a it's a small uh, public charter, so it's not it's not a lot of schools, but they're starting up in August, all in person. Um, Right now, it's all over the map. COVID-19 has created a financial crisis with the federal unemployment benefits going away this week. I know you've been working on trying to expand the state of Michigan's unemployment benefits. Can you talk a little bit about that? What would it be and why is it needed? Well, our uh, maximum unemployment benefit is just a little over $400 a week, which without the federal subsidy right now, you can't pay your bills and feed yourself, let alone a family, on $400 a week. So that is literally starvation pay. And it's been cut repeatedly over the last two decades or so, and uh, uh, we pe people can't survive on that. So without that, extra money from the federal government, we must do more in Michigan. I mean, we simply can't let our people starve, we can't. So um, the uh, eviction moratorium has ended for the state. I know some counties are continuing that and there's some grant protection for landlords and people who need more additional help with eviction issues. But um, you know, given the, if this continues as it is and we continue to have the numbers of people that we have on unemployment, um, we're gonna have to relook at all those basic needs at the state level. And we have proposed that in the Senate. Um, I think that has been uh, proposals in the House as well to raise the, the unemployment rates for all the residents. And so far we have not been able to get a hearing on any of those Democratic bills. Senator Rosemary Bayer with us. She's from Michigan's 12th district with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Senator. Uh, Senator Bayer, we're approaching the primary election in the state of Michigan next week on August 4th, and then, of course, the uh, general election in November, expecting a record number of votes by absentee, ba by absentee ballot. We're already seeing um, absentee ballot registrations are through the roof uh, now with the, of course, 
bill that was passed uh, through the election in 2018, the constitutional amendment allowing for no reason absentee voting. But there are concerns with that, uh, with that being in, in place here in the state of Michigan about there being an influx of mail-in ballots, those having to be into their local clerks by the time that polls close on election day and of the general security of the election because of the influx of mail-in ballots. Even this morning, the president had tweeted suggesting the possibility that we should consider uh, suspending the election or postponing the election until it would be safe to do so. What are your thoughts on the mail-in ballots and being able to submit them in, in a timely manner and what help the state may be able to provide to voters to ensure that their ballots do get in on time without them having to submit them several weeks out from the election when they're making these critical decisions. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't think anybody planned for the budget cuts that have been happening in the post office and the postal service. That's a big piece of some of the challenges we're seeing in delays in delivery. I know I personally experienced things coming in the mail that were, were put in the mailbox two months ago even. So um, yeah, we're gonna have to you know talk about changing dates, timelines for November. Uh, we do have right now, I think we're worried about next week and I, there is a, a website that people can go to if I, I wanna just make sure everybody hears this. It's, you go to mi.gov slash vote. You can, within a minute, check the status. If you've put your ballot in the mail or in the box at your uh, local uh, township office or your city offices, you can check the status of your ballot if it's turned in. They haven't opened it, of course, but you can see if it's been turned in. If it has not, and you should probably go, I mean, think about going over there. Here's your option. Go over to your location, your municipal location, your clerk's office, and have them spoil that ballot, give you a new one. You can then vote right on the spot and turn it in. You can take it out, turn it in, but put it in the box. From this point on, don't be putting things in the mail. Make no assumptions that it'll get there in time for this next week, right, or August 4th. So pick it up vote right there on the spot or take it with you and go back and put it in that box. No more mailing from this point on and check your current status on your ballots. I checked mine. It's mi. It's mi.gov slash vote. That's the best way to find out what's going on. In the future, we're going to have to adjust. I think we'll adjust dates with the, you know, we'll talk with the Secretary of State to, uh, to, to find to make sure that we can, we just, you know, the whole point of this voting rights initiative was to make sure everybody got to vote. And if the, now we're worried that their votes won't get delivered because of changes in the postal system, no, we're going to fix that. We got to fix that. Senator Rosemary Bayer with us from Michigan's 12th district. Just another minute or so before we have to let you go, Senator. Anything else that you'd like to touch on today before we let you go? Um, no, I think the only other thing is just to support the the education teach the teachers the education system in general and our teachers um, we need to make sure that we don't lose teachers we're going to need more teachers than ever this year so we need to hold on to them so support your teachers and secondly wear a mask wear a mask wear a mask wear a mask <laughs> senator bear thank you very much for being with us today Thank you for having me. We appreciate it. Senator Rosemary Bayer from the 12th District in Michigan with us on the Oakland County Megacast. We appreciate having her on the program today and uh, so many different complicated topics that they are working to take, to take care of at the state level, including the elections, including what to do education-wise. The budget is still a huge concern here in the state of Michigan. and it, We're living in ever-complicated times, and that's definitely no less the case in Lansing. You really have to be able to multitask right now to be one of our elected leaders, more so now than ever, because all of these issues are so vital and time sensitive to for families and for people to be able to pay their rent, to, you know, put food on the table, to, you know, pay that utility bill. Those decisions that are being made by our elected leaders need to be made now and in a timely fashion because there is always a delay for it to be put into you know you know, into practice and for people to be able to start taking advantage of it yeah, i think that definitely for the november election with the influx of absentee vote voters that that is going to be a point of conversation on both on both sides of the aisle in lansing after this upcoming 
uh, August primary next week as we approach the general election, a time that's going to be so critical for both of these parties in the state of Michigan going forward over the next four years. So plenty of uh, plenty of interesting things coming from Lansing in the in the next few months. We will stay on top of all those and continue to talk to our state representatives and state senators. That is going to do it for our program today. We thank all of our guests for joining us and our family of TV and radio stations as well as West Bloomfield Parks for joining us on Facebook and our entire crew for making this show happen. For Ronnie Dahl, I'm Tyler Keeft. The Megacast will return tomorrow on Friday.